and from the Kennedy Space Center in Florida, I'm Darren Kagan. Leon, good morning to you. Thanks to, for joining us. Want to take a look. All this hour, we're going to be in touch with the Johnson Space Center in Houston. That is where the astronauts trained and where they'll be remembered tomorrow in a special memorial service held by NASA. The entrance to the Space Center has become a makeshift shrine of flowers and remembrances. Also live this hour, authorities are due to hold a news conference at any moment in Hemp Hill, Texas. That town is near the eastern edge of the debris field that stretches more than 100 miles. Authorities are expected to update those recovery efforts. You'll see that live right here on CNN. Leon. All right. We are also keeping an eye on the market's bottom line to see how investors are reacting to the shuttle disaster and see whether what they stage today is uh, going to be the patriotic rally, as we've uh, seen from time to time. A look down at the big board shows that uh, the Dow is up so far, 50 point uh, three points and uh, so far it looks as though the uh, disaster over the weekend is not having a negative effect on the markets. We'll keep our eye on that. Darren. Leon, we're going to go ahead and start this hour with the investigation. NASA is starting to piece together what might have gone wrong with the space shuttle Columbia. start with that investigation. It is a nationwide effort to piece together the data and debris that could contain the vital clues to the fiery breakup that took place on Saturday. Our space correspondent, Miles O'Brien, has been our point man since the very first moment of the disaster. He's joined us now. He is at Johnson Space Center in Houston. Miles, good morning. Good morning, Darren. More specifically, I'm in Building 9 at the Johnson Space Center. That doesn't mean anything to anybody outside the space community, but Building 9 is the place where astronauts come to train for all sorts of bad eventualities. Take a look at the kinds of simulators they have in this building, a full-scale mock-up of the space shuttle orbiter right there, one of many simulators here, where astronauts come to uh, figure out what they would do when things go drastically wrong. The big question this morning is, was there anything anyone could have done to prevent what occurred on Saturday morning as Columbia streaked toward its landing at the Kennedy Space Center? Take a look at some film. This is the film which will be the focus of much of our attention in the months to come. The question is, what does this really mean? It is a piece of something coming off the orange external tank. These are high-speed engineering films that are shot as the shuttle rises to orbit. They're analyzed a day or so after launch by engineering teams to see exactly what you're seeing, if anything falls off the orbiter as it goes up. As you can see, what appears to be a piece of foam Maybe it's some ice, but it certainly acts a lot like foam. Falls off that orange external tank and hits in the left wing area. That left wing area is where all the trouble began as the Columbia came in toward its landing. Let's give you a sense of what NASA knows so far. The first sign of trouble began as Columbia streaked over Northern California at 8.53 a.m. Eastern Time. Temperature sensors inside the control flaps at the trailing edge of the orbiter's wings suddenly register zero, as if the lines were cut. Those cables wound their way through the left wheel well, and at the same time, the temperature inside it was spiking, rising 20 to 30 degrees in five minutes. One minute later, 8.54 Eastern, a temperature sensor inside the left fuselage records a 60-degree increase over five minutes. The right side is up 15 degrees, perfectly normal. Four minutes later, 8.58, Columbia is over New Mexico, and the orbiter is pulling to the left. The computer-driven autopilot compensates by moving those flaps, called elevons, in the opposite direction. Does this mean something to us? We're not sure. It can be indicative of rough tile. It can be indicative of perhaps missing tile. In the left wheel well, those temperature sensors go silent one by one. One minute later, 8.59, Columbia's computers are still trying to compensate for that bank to the left, and then there is nothing. A loss of signal, but not a complete loss, it appears. We do believe that there, are, there is additional information to us, uh, another 32 seconds that we believe if we go into our computer system on the ground that we can pull out additional data it means the vehicle may have been intact enough to be transmitting something. No one knows how useful that data may be. NASA engineers are also focusing a lot of attention on the beginning of Columbia's final voyage. 
About 80 seconds after launch, a piece of foam, or perhaps some ice, fell off the shuttle's orange external fuel tank. It struck somewhere underneath the left wing. Is it a coincidence or a smoking gun? Neither is being ruled out. But NASA says when engineers spotted the debris after reviewing high-speed film of the launch shot with a long telephoto, there was a lot of discussion about how much damage that debris might have caused. It's not unusual to see foam and ice fall off fuel tanks, and the shuttle team determined the damage was probably not significant. But perhaps more to the point, no matter how bad the damage, there was nothing anyone on the ground or in orbit could do. Now, a lot of people wonder why nothing could be done. Here's a couple things to think about. First of all, the tiles on a space shuttle, there are 27,000 of them. There were 27,000 of them on Columbia. Each of them is unique, like a snowflake, if you will. So to really have a practical tile repair kit, you'd have to bring 27,000 spares, obviously not practical. And there's no such thing as a bondo or whatever to seal those things up. If the bondo was available to seal them up, that's probably what they would use to coat the bottom of the space shuttle. The bottom line is these ceramic tiles, for all their fragility, are really the only way to protect something like this from 3,000 degree heat. Just let me show you a quick scene below me here, Building 9. This is the first official day back to work here at the Johnson Space Center. Of course, they've been working all weekend, many of them, but uh, some of the people in this building coming to back to work for the first time since the tragedy, many of them pausing here to look at the members of the crew of STS-107 who spent many, many hours in this building working with these trainers and simulator operators. Uh, Darren, this, it's uh, been said many times, but this is a family, and I've seen many people this morning in this building with NASA badges on in tears. Yeah, well, well Miles, if it's a family, then I, I think, feel like the cousins are here in Florida, so by being on this at this Space Center, I'm definitely getting a feel for what you're talking about by being here at Kennedy in Florida. I want to ask you something, uh, because I think as the time goes on, different theories are going to pop up, and it seems since Saturday morning we've heard about ice potentially falling off, uh, possibly falling off during the ascent and hitting the left wing, but what, what kind of involvement possibly could it have with the left landing gear? Well, here's the, the key on all of this. Uh, first thing you have to know is that foam and ice have been falling off those external tanks literally since the first flight. They've been watching this for every single shuttle mission. That's just part of the, the way these things operate. The key to understanding the uh, left landing uh, gear door is that that is really, as one engineer put it, one of the Achilles heels of the space shuttle. All those doors have seams, of course, and those seams are potential weak spots for this, you know, uh, blowtorch-like heat. And if, for example, something bumped that door and, and warped it slightly, and that created some kind of swirling vortex of air underneath there. Just a bump could do that. That could create, in essence, a blowtorch of heat which could go down through that seam. And once you're inside that wheel well, past that barrier of heat protecting, uh, it is completely unprotected thermally. There's a series of cables and wires and hydraulics that go through there, and uh, you have a serious, serious problem at that point. Yeah, Miles, I'll, I'll tell you one thing, having the chance for the first time to visit the Kennedy Space Center here and getting to go up against and stand next to a shuttle and, and the rocket boosters, you get a much greater appreciation uh, of how difficult and the miracle of what they do in getting the shuttles up in space safely, and you can have a better, better appreciation of all that can go wrong. We're going to check back with you a little bit later in the morning and also look forward to NASA, which will be providing an update on the investigation in the next hour. Of course, we're going to see that live here. Twice a day briefings beginning today, the first 11.30 a.m. Eastern. CNN, of course, is going to bring that to you live. Leon, for now, back to you. Yeah, okay, good deal. Thanks, Darren. And while all that is going on, the intensity of the investigation is going to take a pause tomorrow, albeit briefly, for a memorial service honoring those seven astronauts. President Bush is planning to go to Houston to attend the National Memorial at Johnson Space Center. And that is where CNN's Rusty Dornan is this morning. Let's check in with her right now and get the very latest from there. Good morning, Rusty. Well, you know, Leon, Houston is a big city, but when it comes to the space program, it's really a small town. Just about everybody here has a family member or a friend that works here at the Johnson Space Center. In fact, a lot of folks refer to Houston as Space City. And the space program really is their pride and joy. It provides heroes in a world where there seems to be darn few. These are the astronauts. These are the clouds right here. They were heroes to Garrett Van Zell. I'm pretty sad about it. 
A sadness that leads people here, a memorial outside the Space Center that grows by the hour. I felt like I needed to come down and, and be a part of it because Houston, Johnson Space Center, it's, it's home. Home to those lost, but not forgotten. And of course, they will be remembered in the official memorial tomorrow here at the Houston Space Center. President Bush is expected to attend. And of course, we are hearing now with all the debate going on about the space program that President Bush is pushing an increase in funding for NASA for 2004 over 2003, which is, of course, good news to folks here. Leon? All right, thanks, Wesley. Good to hear that. Wesley Jordan reporting live for us from Houston, Texas.